So, Matthew Mekis, uh, I work for AWS and I'm a serverless specialist. So, I spend my days helping people build uh, distributed systems, uh, microservices, uh, event driven systems, and, and, and modern technology. And as always with these things, you know, the challenges that people face are not technology challenges, it's always people problems. And you know, a big challenge around that is the way that people try to simplify the world to meet the technology rather than understanding where the challenges are, accepting those challenges, and then architecting their technology to uh, express those challenges and the complexities that are in them. And um, so my hypothesis is that uh, whilst having things in neat order is very appealing, and feels great in your design meetings, actually we have to embrace the chaos and think asynchronously to build modern technology. Um, so I'll start with you know, where people start on this kind of modern microservices journey, which is building synchronous microservices. And that's because people like the idea of having uh, a directed command. So I wanted to be able to go and say, hey, can you go and uh, send this email to this customer? And in a directed way, I'll wait for them to send that email and they'll come back to me and say, okay, I've sent it now, Matt. Great, I know it's been sent. I don't have to worry about it anymore and I can get on with my life. And that's great. And we start building our systems. So here I work for, for Amazon. We've got an e-commerce system and we've built a, a synchronous commanded platform that does that. I've got my ordering system that's gonna go and make sure everything happens in the right order goes and sends off my order to the fulfillment team to go and send something. We go and take some money off a customer. And we also go and update their, their, their payment, um, their loyalty points. And so far, so good. It's all great. We can reason about this. An error happens. We get a hard error. So the payment system fails. Again, this is pretty easy to understand. The payment system fails. So we should back out the order, cancel everything, tell the customer it's canceled. And that's also easy to reason about. But when we're building these distributed systems, hard failures are much less common than these kind of soft gray failures. So in this case, we're sending something to the order to the loyalty system. The loyalty system hasn't failed, but it's acting slowly. So it takes 10, 10 seconds for that um, to get back to the, to the ordering system. So now is this loyalty system a requirement? Should we uh, wait and just uh, leave the little uh, beach ball spinning for the customer and, and let them have a bad experience? Should we cancel the order because we think it's broken and send them a quick response? Um, now, there's all kinds of other grave failures we can have. So what happens if we take an order that's got 12 items and two of them are out of stock? Should we update the order? Should we cancel the order completely? Should we refund the money? Do we need to get a new confirmation? And then, you know, our free service system is nowhere close to representative of what, what real systems look like in the real world. We bought a new CRM platform. Um, this is a third party solution. They've got their own SLA and they're having a maintenance window next Thursday. What are we gonna do about that? And we end up with uh, the classic microservices ball of mud architecture and uh, things, are, things are pretty hard. And so it's worth, you know, these distributed systems, they're, they're difficult to do. Why should we even bother? What's the point of uh, building microservices and distributed systems? Um, there's a couple of big reasons why. One, we need to have organizational scalability. So we can't just have one giant team of a thousand engineers all working on the same product, shipping once every six months if we want to achieve uh, organizational agility goals. We need to have small independent teams that can work on small projects so they can ship at their own, um, at their own uh, cadence in order to live the, the, the agility that our businesses need. We want really, really fast feedback loops. A real big you know, principle of Agile is we need to ship stuff, we need to get uh, information about how it's behaving in production and bake that into our next release. We need to reduce external dependencies. So we can't have, every time we need to, uh, um, we need to make a release, we can't have a, a steering group of hundreds of people meet up and decide what's the impact of this release gonna be. And we need to reduce blast radius because everything breaks all the time. And when it does break, we can't have material parts of our customer experience uh, affected. And so if we think about you know, all these goals that we have, we can think about what architectural characteristic we need to achieve these goals. And at its most abstract, what we're looking to achieve is, is a modularity. Um, so 
looking in the dictionary for a, a definition of modularity. So modularity is separate parts when combined form a complete whole. But I thought it was actually more interesting to look at what it isn't. So a system lacks modularity when a tweak to one component affects all the others. And I think that's something we've all seen when we're building software. Okay, we've shipped some system and we didn't expect it to break everything and take down production, uh, but it has, and that's because it lacks modularity. But breaking things into modular systems doesn't simplify them necessarily, so smaller isn't simpler. Um, but it's, and there's lots of different ways that you can express modularity. So if I look at the first way, we can express modularity through code. So in this uh, option here, we've got uh, a beautifully designed code. We've got great engineers working on our team. And um, they've built a system where you know, each part is independent and testable. Um, and the infrastructure is three boxes. It's a three-tier solution. And the architects are all happy. Hey, this is simple. We've got a three-tier solution. We can stand one up in, in devs, uh, staging, and production. Now, somewhere in there is hiding some complexity. So how can we actually see where all of these interactions and all this modularity is? Um, it can be really, really challenging. When people start to adopt serverless, suddenly their architecture diagram goes from three boxes to 300 boxes. And the enterprise architects all start to panic. And the business leaders say, hey, this, this looks really, really complex. There's a lot of complexity here. Um, now, actually, all the complexity that's in this diagram is probably somewhere hiding in code in the first system. It's just a different view on that same modularity. And when you're starting to build these things, we've got all these separate systems, these separate modules. They start to uh, get abstracted for, um, from each other, and they start to um, adopt an event of an architecture. It's almost inevitable that your systems take on some form of event of an architecture. Yeah. But if you're not mindful about it, what you end up with is accidental event-driven architecture. In this sprint, I need to decouple this system, so I stick a queue between system A and system B, and suddenly it's an event-driven architecture. But that accidental complexity is just there based on these short-term goals that are in front of you in that current sprint, and not actually based on that long-term strategic pattern of where you want to bake uh, complexity into your system. So how do we avoid that accidental complexity? Um, you know, one of the tools we have is domain-driven design. So domain-driven design is, is a tool that uh, addresses the main reason that software projects fail, and that's communication. And um, so it helps build effective communication with product teams, with engineers, and uh, uh, the line of business people. Um, and helps us categorize uh, the business domains between, in the system. So where do we actually make the cuts? Where do we actually build the modularity? And actually can help drive the, uh, the organizational structure we need to address our problems. I think this is one of my favorite quotes around what we actually build as, as software engineers. So Alberto Brandolini said, yeah, this is all great, but what actually gets shipped in production is the developer's misunderstanding of, <laughs> of what they thought the business wanted them to do. So domain-driven design helps us build a ubiquitous language um, that is uh, modeled within a, in, a, in a context um, so there's no ambiguity. So to bring that to life, uh, we've got our Amazon.com uh, e-commerce system. Um, almost every system on Amazon.com cares about orders. But what an order means to each of those systems is really, really different. The retail team looks at an order and they say, I want to know the price, I want to know the color, I want to know what sizes are available. Um, then you go off to the fulfillment team, and they want to know where is it in the warehouse, how much does it weigh, and did the customer order it on same day or next day shipping? And then the returns team and customer support, they want to know how do they pay for it, what are the warranty terms? And so each of those teams within returns, within fulfillment, within, um, within retail, they have a ubiquitous language around an order. But across those teams, um, yeah, they've got a completely different context, and they care very, yeah, about very, very different things. And we can use these uh, areas where there's unique, ubiquitous language to break down our system into bounded contexts. So within each one of these bounded contexts, um, we can, uh, everyone is talking about exactly the same language when they're, when they're talking about their system and their entities. And so we can move on. I'll do a little bit of a primer on event-driven architecture. So I've mentioned it a few times now, but it's worth just uh, being explicit about what an event is. So an event is a verb. It's a signal that something has changed. Uh, it's immutable, and it happened in the past. So um, 
the lights are switched on. I can't unswitch on the lights. I have to have a compensating event. I can switch the lights back off again, and the lights were switched off, and that's an event. And so you started off at the beginning with a, with a commanding model where someone says, okay, go and send that email, and you're gonna wait there until the email's been sent. Incredibly easy to reason about. With event-driven architectures, we're moving to uh, an observable event. So I can say, hey, an order's come in, everybody, and I'm trusting that the rest of my team are gonna go off and do their jobs, they're gonna take the payment, they're gonna fulfill the order, they're gonna tell the customer um, that it's been made. Now, that's harder to reason about in lots of ways, so we're adding in uh, a difficulty. I don't know that all those things have happened, but the benefit, the trade-off is that you know, we can bring on a new team and we want a, an AI ML team who's gonna go and do analysis on a recommendation engine for customers' orders. They can come on, we don't have to make any changes to that initial orchestration system. They can just listen to that event and uh, carry on and really, really helps build that, um, that agility. When we're looking at event-driven systems, we don't start thinking about what are the system events, a database record inserted. We want to think about uh, business events. You know, we've got orders being created, uh, the fulfillment team have to pick and pack, um, returns have to be requested, received, fulfilled. <clears throat> and when we're mapping them uh, to business domains, we need to use their attributes, not entities. So it's a, a real anti-pattern to start building an order system. And we want to build an order system that acts as a single source of truth for orders across our whole platform. And it's going to be correct for the retail team, and it's going to be correct for the fulfillment team and the returns team, because they all have completely different business processes, completely different views of the world. So we need to map to those, uh, those business domains. And then between those domains, we should be using event-driven architectures. So we should be able to admit an event that order's been created um, from our retail team, and we're trusting that our fulfillment team is gonna go and pick it up. And when they're done, they're gonna release a new event. Okay, we've done with that, Matt. And uh, you can go and finish that process for all of those agility reasons. But there is a trade-off. So every, uh, every part of our system shouldn't use event-driven architectures, probably, because of that complexity to understand and reason about. So if you're inside a domain, if you're inside the fulfillment team, and everybody who's working on the fulfillment product sits in the same room, and they all know each other, and they're all working to the same roadmap, and they all release on the same day, actually then that commanding pattern orchestrating within a domain uh, and then works really, really well. And typically what you'll have is this orchestration with some sort of transaction that happens with one team. At the end of that process, you'll emit a publishing event that then other teams go and pick up. So as always with, with these, these things, it's all about trade-offs and understanding where to apply those patterns. When we're thinking about these business domains, um, I like to classify them into three groups. We've got core domains supporting and generic. A core domain is what makes our business unique. It's what's gonna make us money. We're gonna build it over buy it because we care about it. We're gonna ship it every day, multiple times a day because we want a fast feedback loop. And we're gonna invest in organizational structure. This is gonna have a dedicated team apply to each of these core domains who's probably in-house and, uh, and working full time on that project. Um, supporting domain, doesn't have necessarily a competitive advantage. So in my retail example, this might be the payment system. Uh, you might buy, you might build. Um, you're not expecting to ship changes to your payment system every week, um, hopefully. There's less organizational investment. Um, so you might have uh, be part of another team's role uh, to deliver, probably not a dedicated team. And then our generic domain is um, needed, but not part of the core business. So this might be a CRM platform. Um, you probably buy it rather than build it yourself. Um, some sort of off-the-shelf solution. You might outsource it if you do want to build it, so it doesn't really matter um, for your organizational um, uh, changes. But domain-driven design is it's just part of the solution. So we need a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, we need to actually decentralize our organization. Um, we need to invest in automation, continuous delivery. Um, we need governance, decentralized governance. There's definitely uh, an hour-long talk on, on how to achieve that. Definitely not an easy one. So we've decided we do want to have a domain-driven design approach and adopt event-driven architectures for agility. How do we start? Um, my favorite way of doing that is uh, event storming. 
And so Alberto Brandolini is the guy who created event storming, and he said uh, it's a odd-looking workshop with a massive consumption of uh, orange sticky notes. Um, if you looked at my boxes and boxes of orange sticky notes that I take around with me as I help customers do this, you'd know. Uh, he's absolutely right. And we use uh, event storming to discover our domains, uh, identify the boundaries in a system. We use it to share knowledge with teams. So it's a really, really powerful exercise to get business people and technology people in the same room talking about where the complexity is. I think this is one of the most powerful things that I've seen when I've done it, that there's often um, a lack of empathy between business people who think, why is it, why, why, why is it so complicated to the techno technology teams? And the technology teams are saying, why can't you explain what you want me to do? And actually putting them in the room and actually un unpicking why these things are complex, why there's so many stakeholders involved in a process really helps um, build empathy. It can be used on greenfield, brownfield projects, so new builds and um, existing projects. And you can use it at different levels of granularity. So you can do big picture event storming uh, across a whole organizational process, or you can deep dive into an individual service or part of a process to optimize uh, um, something much smaller. Um, you can do all sorts of different scale. This is a really fun session we did where we had almost 300 people doing an event storming session. So we had multiple teams doing detail-driven event storming. We had big picture event storming across a whole organization, and then repeated that with different sets of people to really, really deep dive into a process um, over the course of two days. So how it works is uh, you start off um, thinking about your process, discovering all the events, and sticking them with orange sticky notes on the whiteboard. There's no filtering, you're gonna clean up later. And um, the only thing I do as a facilitator where I'm enforcing this, I'm just saying, making sure that people are putting verbs in the past tense. They are actually talking about events and not commands or, or aggregates or any of the other features. We then start to do some temporal sequencing. So we go left to right with our sticky notes, delete all the duplicates, um, add in anything that we missed, usually quite a lot. And then we can stack events that happen at the same time, because there's usually a whole bunch of parallel processes. Our next step is we then start to um, do trigger detection. So we start to think about actors, who are the commands, um, what are the systems that we have to do, uh, interact with to, 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 to build this process. Then we go through and identify aggregates. So we think about the nouns that are operated on by these events. Um, in our you know, retail system, you know, so items, orders, payments, sellers, they'll crop up multiple times. So in each of these groups, you might have that same noun uh, appearing over and over again. But it's really useful to help um, start to think where, where interesting boundaries might lie. And then finally, we categorize into, into bounded contexts. Um, so we are uh, you know, optimizing to reduce the dependencies between each bounded context. So you might try several different scenarios to get the least amount of dependencies. You want to make sure inside each of those bounded contexts, the language stays the same. So you know, we want that order to have the same attributes inside each of those boxes. And as I say, you, know, you expect that same aggregate to be in each of those boxes. So if we've got an order inside every single box, it's really telling us that we want multiple different ways um, of expressing that. So we'll have multiple different microservices. And you know, in this case, we're, we're accepting duplication to reduce coupling. So that's uh, you know, a single source of truth. Don't repeat yourself. Um, not always the best way of doing things. Accept duplication where you think it's going to give you more, more, more um, agility. A couple of common gotchas. Um, if one microservice is uh, impacting multiple bounded contexts, be careful. This is particularly true when you're refactoring a brownfield solution. So you'll go in and look at your existing, um, uh, your existing estate, your existing processes, and you quite often find one or two services that basically touch every single system in the stack. That's a case where you want to be a little bit ambitious and spend some time really thinking about how you should break that up uh, in order to uh, refactor that system. And because if you don't do that, you can uh, build what we call a uh, distributed monolith. So uh, you've got tight coupling even though you've adopted microservices. And if you've got an entity or an aggregate in multiple bounded contexts, um, having two different microservices is absolutely fine don't get caught out by having your single source of truth order system. 
So just to wrap up, communication is absolutely pivotal in, in software projects. Uh, event storming is a great mechanism to actually break your software into business domains. And you can drive not only your technical organization, but those bounded contents will also start to drive your organizational implementation. Um, so hopefully that was useful. I've stuck a whole load of resources up if anyone wants to take a picky around uh, domain-driven design, event storming, and of course, I'm not sure if anybody has come here today and not talked about team topologies. <laughs> I'm just about on time. Brilliant. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah.